Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I always like to say I represent the Historical Society, which is actually trying to tell your story. Um, maybe not you particular, but the stuff that was happening when you were here and the stuff that happened in the past. And I think I can tell you some stuff maybe you will be amazed about that you didn't know happened. So we're going to have a little fun maybe, a little uh, expand your brain a little bit, and just enjoy it. Kind of think of some things that uh, happened before. And one thing I've learned is that people haven't changed much. So 100 years ago, people were doing kind of the same thing you are. They didn't have these things you can, you know, punch in and talk to someone way over there. But they thought kind of the same thing. They did the same thing. And you might think back in the 1890s that kids like your age didn't have a whole lot of fun. But I've read a lot of people in the, in the newspaper where they might get a wagon. There was one, one uh, incident that I can think about. This is January, like 1880s. It's cold. And what do they do? They get in a wagon. There's a couple wagons of them. And they drive a sleigh, I guess it is, a sleigh, to Milford. And they have a party at Milford. Someone knows someone at Milford, and they say, let's go up to Milford. Let's have a party. And they come back. They stay up there until the, the newspaper says wee hours of the morning. So imagine 1890, you're in a sleigh, driving up to Milford, have a party, come back, wee hours of the morning. A lot of you probably don't think people back then got outside of Warsaw, but they did. There's a thing, they had a party over, they went over to the uh, same thing in Pearson. Went over there, drive back, had a party. There's a... Uh, I remember one case where they have, uh, here in town, Warsaw, they had a, a, like a backyard decorated with Japanese lanterns, and they have uh, young people and young married people there. They have a mandolin band there. So they could have quite a lot of fun. Most of the lakes had these uh, big toboggans. You go to the toboggan, and you go right into the lake. Of course, that was summertime. But, I mean, they could have a lot of fun. So that's just sort of a preference. I'd like to start this, though, by saying a bad word. I wouldn't normally do this, maybe, but I think you've heard every bad word there is. So I think I can do that. You may even have bad words in combinations I never heard of before. So I want you to get this bad word in your mind. Got it? OK. Here's this bad word, rattlesnakes. Pretty bad, don't you think? Because if they're, imagine a rattlesnake coming across here, what, what would you do? I think you'd be, yeah, yeah, you'd be jumping around, screaming, hollering. And I say that because this county used to have lots and lots of rattlesnakes. For example, there was a guy, well, this is like a, uh, 18 or 1930s, he's walking his dog on Winona Lake, at the edge of Winona Lake. Uh, you know about where uh, Oregon Road comes down? Well, the dog is bitten by a rattlesnake there. Uh, guys are fishing on the Tippecanoe River, up, uh, you know, where 15 crosses it. Well, one of the guys is bitten by a rattlesnake. Uh, the county commissioners are looking at a uh, ditch between here and, and Atwood. And one of the guys says to the other, you know, you ought to take this like a tire tool, you know, that you change your tires with, just in case you run into a rattlesnake. And the guy says, ah, I'm not going to run into a rattlesnake. So they're looking at this ditch, and sure enough, there's a rattlesnake there, and he kills it, and it has like eight rattles. So the story of rattlesnakes goes clear back to the county's beginning, like, uh, and if you want to date, 1836 is when this county started. And, and the pioneers would go in and, and, and cut grass and let it dry for hay for their, for their animals. And a lot of times they'd come back and there'd be a rattlesnake in this, in this hay. So I've never, I've never uh, seen exactly what kind of rattlesnake, but I think it was what they call Masagawa, which is a swamp rattlesnake. They're uh, only about three feet long. Uh, now, if I saw a rattlesnake crawling through here three feet long, that'd be pretty bad. 
But still, it's not like uh, the ones you find out west that are might be six feet and all that. Um, <clears throat> and they weren't particularly venomous. So I don't know of anyone that ever died from them. Your leg might hurt and swell up. You know, but it, it wouldn't kill you. So here's, here's my best story about a rattlesnake. This takes place up around Leesburg. Uh, a grandmother and her daughter, I, I guess granddaughter, were out on the porch. This is the summer. And you know, back, uh, this is in the 1930s, and it was really hot there. You think of the Dust Bowl and all that. There's no air conditioning, so they're sitting out on this uh, on the porch, trying to kind of get, get cool a little bit. And this rattlesnake crawls up and crawls onto the grandmother's dress. Now, I think we have to sort of think about the time period. And this would have been a long dress, I think. So it would have touched the floor, not like it crawled into her lap or anything. So what do you think this grandmother did when she saw this snake? She screamed, yeah, exactly. She jumped up and screamed, and fortunately the rattlesnake, you know, kind of flew off. And, and by that time her husband and the hired hand came along and killed it. And I think this had nine rattles. So, if there were that many rattlesnakes 75 years ago, there might be some yet today. So if you're out uh, hunting mushrooms pretty soon, you might just sort of be aware. I haven't heard of any in a long time, but, but they might be there. So just, just so you'll know. Uh, any questions about rattlesnakes? Yes. A lot of them out when they were doing the complete reconstruction of like the village at Winona. I know I heard back when um, they pulled quite a few out. I'm not aware of that. I know when they built Rosella Ford golf course here, they found a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. What's the significance about the number of rattles they have? Uh, supposedly, uh, how old they are. And I'm not sure whether it starts, you know, maybe they get their first rattle at two or something. So. But, so an eight would have been at least eight years old. And uh, they're, they're, they were black, mostly black, so they were called black rattlesnakes, which means it's harder to find them. Yeah. You said they weren't poisonous? Yes, they were, but not deadly poisonous. You know, like a diamondback rattle or a sidewinder. Some of them are a lot more, more uh, poisonous. Um, I might talk about another thing. You might be fortunate today to live in Warsaw now because when it was founded, it was probably the worst place anywhere for a town. That's because, kind of in reference to these rattlesnakes, it was the downtown area was kind of an island surrounded by swamps and really bad swamps. You could hardly get in and out of Warsaw for a long time. Um, Center Park used to be a big swamp. And it went all the way from Center Lake. There was nothing down by the shore of Center Lake. It went from Center Lake clear up to the back of Zimmer building. And uh, Fort Wayne Street, you know, which, which runs through there, was called Water Street because it was covered with water a lot of times. And that whole area was called the Cat Swamp because it was filled with cattails. Um, the area on Center Street, if you start at the library and go east, let's see, that'd be that way. Or, or Market Street, maybe Market Street's better. You know where the, uh, let's see, Little Crow uh, condominiums are now. If you're going east there, next time you go down there, notice you, you drop down pretty, pretty sharp uh, past the Dollar General and you go, that used to be a big swamp. And over the years, they filled that up a lot. Sometimes you might, uh, let's see, Park Avenue's there, if you turn 
down Park Avenue, you'll see how far that drops down. If you're on Center Street that same way, let's see, there's a, a barber shop, today's headlines. If you go to the parking lot in back, you'll see how far you drop down. And, and that's all been built up over the years, but originally, I mean, you couldn't get through there. I mean, it was all swamp, and uh, for a while, let's say if you wanted to go to Fort Wayne, the only way to get there from downtown Warsaw, if you know where Fort Wayne Avenue is, it goes behind, let's see, the Domino's Pizza, kind of an angle, and then it hits Fort Wayne Avenue, or Fort Wayne Street. Next time you're going down Fort Wayne Street, Try and notice that if you go towards Main Street, it drops off pretty sharp towards that swamp. If you go a block or two the other way, it drops off into uh, the backwaters of Pike Lake. And that was all a swamp. So if you wanted to go to Fort Wayne, say, the only way is Fort Wayne Avenue to Fort Wayne. And it was called that because Fort Wayne was the biggest town that way. Uh, the other side of Warsaw, Let's see, out where the waterworks plant is, or, or sewer plant, that was all a big swamp. Now imagine it's 1840, and you're living in downtown Warsaw. Uh, there's no air conditioning. I don't even think there's screen doors. So when you open the doors or the windows in the summer, all the flies fly in, all the mosquitoes fly in, I don't know how people ever survived. It would just have been a horrible place. But I guess they did, and they, they made it. Um, so, I know one question you're going to ask is, why was Warsaw put in the middle of this swamp? Okay. Uh, well, there's, there's, there's a reason, and what I think, sort of the story behind the reason. But the reason is, that is in the geographic center of the county, and they sort of wanted the middle of the county, so if you had to pay your taxes or go shopping or whatever in a wagon, you could go from Silver Lake and hook it up and get all the way here in a wagon and back home before dark. But the other thing is Leesburg already existed. It was a little town because uh, there were some uh, Indian villages around there, and so it started out as sort of a trading post with the Indians, and pretty soon there was a blacksmith shop, and I think the first school was there, uh, the commissioners met there, the first court was there, so it already existed. So you're kind of wondering, if there was already a town, why did they make the county seat Warsaw, which didn't even exist, and was this you know, surrounded by swamps and terrible sort of thing. Uh, well, the guy that named it was this area's representative in the Indiana State Legislature. And he lived at Leesburg. So you figure also, why would this guy, who knew all about this, still pick Warsaw, besides being in the middle of the county? Well, he was, he was wealthy enough, he could buy property. So he bought property around Warsaw, figuring it's going to take off, and he's going to, he's going to sell it, and he's going to be really rich. Ah. Well, there happened to be economic turndown right about that time, and nobody wanted the land, and he couldn't really sell it, and he just let it go for nothing, and he moved off. And you might wonder also uh, how it got its name. And uh, the same guy, his name was Chapman. You've heard of Chapman Lakes, and, it, and it's sort of named after, the lake is named after he and his family. Uh, but Thaddeus Kosciuszko was a hero of the Revolutionary War. Maybe you've heard of him. He came over from Poland and helped George Washington. Uh, he helped set up the defenses at West Point and at the Battle of Saratoga, which was an important American victory. So he was a hero. Uh, but I like to say the other side of this story is that uh, Indiana was settled basically from the Ohio River north. Uh, Fort Wayne would be an exception, but mostly uh, from the south to the north. So George Washington, Washington County is down south. Franklin, that's down south. 
See, they got the name them first. Uh, Harrison, William Henry Harrison. That's down south. The heroes of the Battle of Tippecanoe, like uh, Davies and Owens, they're all down south. So, in a way, we got, we got the last pick. Uh, any questions? Okay, I'll move on to something else. Uh, here's something that, that I always thought was kind of fun. I used to do canoeing, and actually I built a, kind of, a kayak of my own before anybody knew what a kayak was. So I'd go down the river, and, and somebody fishing would say, what is that? But um, if you go out uh, Fox Farm Road and cross the Tippecanoe River, if you know where that is, there's a big straightaway on the river uh, upstream to the east. And if you go by the rivers, you know they're really curvy. And you might wonder why that was. And this goes back to the swamps, I guess. But originally, the river, uh, if you go north on 15 past, I don't know, Coles and Texas Roadhouse and all that, you cross the Tippecanoe River, right? And then it, it goes on the north side of, of Center Lake and eventually goes out on Old 30. But originally, uh, the river went right along the side, the north, east, northwest side of uh, Center Lake by Fox Farm Road. And if you know where the uh, open air garden center is, there's a little, little creek that goes there. Well, that used to be the Tippecanoe River. And then it came back north. So, in the winter, like, like say when the snow is melting and the rains come in the spring, the water didn't make that turn under the open air market. It went into Center Lake, and that's what it caused it way to back up. And that's what made that swamp. So eventually they cut that off. So the Tippecan River just fly, flows right past. Um, let's see, I might say here's another thing that I think is interesting. Oh wait, I'll go back to the uh, how Warsaw got its name and how Warsaw's here, and it was in the middle of the swamp. A lot of people at that time said, why don't we just move it back to Leesburg, which is already a town, and we get rid of all this swamp. And so, well, they said, you know, it's, it's in the middle of the county. We've got to have it in the middle of the county. So there was a big group that said the, there's, it's like six miles from Warsaw to Leesburg. So they said, if we would take off the bottom six miles of the county, then the middle of the county would be Leesburg. So they said, let's do that. And they became known as the Clippers because they wanted to cut off the six bottom miles of the county. And they, would, they didn't care what happened to it. They could give it to Wabash County or Fulton County or some other county. And so for a long time, they tried to do that. Uh, for a while, they tried to make Oswego the county seat instead of Warsaw. But what happened was the uh, representative from this area wanted Warsaw to remain the county seat. So he never did anything in the state legislature, and nothing happened, and, and Warsaw continued as a county seat. Can you talk a little bit about the difference between the power of the county at the time period and now? Like is there a big difference in terms of people interacting with county government versus where we're at now? Uh, no, I don't, I don't really think so. Um, the first thing they had, I might say, when the county became a county was an election. You know, you got to have a judge and a, a sheriff and all that stuff, and that's how they got, got all that. Um, talking about the... the uh, uh, geography, I might say if you, if you walk outside now, say out by Fisher Field, and you look around, you see trees. You know, I mean, it might be across 15, there's a row of trees. It might be to south, there's a the trees. You might have to look across a, a farm field to see trees. And you would think in the early days, this was one solid uh, forest of trees. And it was for a large part, but there were 
some prairies. Now, you know, prairies are treeless plains. And these are up by Leesburg. And next time you go north on 15 and north of Leesburg, look off to your left, which would be west, and you'll see just a big open spot. The only place there, uh, there are trees are around houses, which have been planted later. These would have been tall grass prairies, so the grass probably would have been this high. And from what we get, they were really colorful. Um, you know, wildflowers, uh, sunflowers, all kinds of wildflowers in them. Uh, there was another one that went kind of northwest or northeast of Leesburg. So again, if you're driving there and you look up that way, you'll see it's just really open and the trees are a long ways away. And, and the one that went west was like six miles by three or four miles. So pretty big. And the other one was slightly smaller. Uh, the one that went west was called Big Turkey Prairie because wild turkeys were there. The other was Little Turkey Prairie because there were turkeys there. <clears throat> so that's why the Indians went there and why the trading posts went there. Um, let's see, what else can I tell you about? Well, one of the things I do is try and find things that people don't know too much about and ask people about them and find out about them. So, I knew that there was a cigar store Indian at a cigar store that used to be at the corner of Center in Buffalo. It's a brick building. I don't know if there's anything in there now or not. It used to be Claney's ice cream. It's diagonally across from the city building. Um, I knew that because I, I read a lot of the old newspapers and there was a little item there, just, just a little paragraph that said uh, the guy had gotten a cigar store Indian and he, he looked really good and he'll guard the entrance or something like that. And then later, the owner of this store was moving it from like the entrance to the side of the building. And the newspaper saw this and sort of had fun with it and said they were Indian wrestling, you know, and, and that for a while the Indian got the best of it and eventually he got it moved. But along the way, the Indian fell against the, the wall, the brick wall, and, and something broke off some of the fingers. So ever since then, I, I'd ask people, did you ever know about this cigar store Indian? And they'd say, well, you know, these are people 90s, 95. And they'd say, well, you know, I know there was one there, but I don't remember it because I was like four years old or something at the time. We think it lasted up until the 30s or so. And so I'd, I'd ask people and I'd ask people and they'd say, well, and finally, my wife and I just visited this lady we knew. She's a former teacher here. Uh, her name was Jeanette Harvitt. Maybe some of you remember her. Um, just, just to visit, and I happened to say, do you remember this st cigar store Indian? And she said, well, yeah. She said, uh, she lived in Leesburg then as a kid. And she said on her, like Saturdays, everybody come into Warsaw to shop on Saturdays back then. And she said she and her, his, her sister with her family would drive in and there were three things she had to do when they got here. One was go to their piano lesson. One was check out a book at the library. And the other thing was to visit that Indian. And she said, you know, they'd go down there. Her father, her father had, had kind of measure them, see if they'd grown. I think they were seven or eight, maybe. See if they were grown. They'd lift her up. You know, they'd run their fingers on this thing. And she had this great description of it. It was kind of a dark brown uh, in the how, you know, how the Indians say how. And, uh, but she said there was something wrong with the fingers. She couldn't quite remember what was wrong with the fingers. Well, they were broken off from that. So it made a perfect description of what we couldn't find. And see, that's a prominent corner, but there was no pictures, no pictures of it anywhere. So it was just fun to get that, and all of a sudden, here it is. You know, you try for years asking people about it, and there it is. Any questions? 
Okay. What about uh, zoner and biomet? Uh, well, uh, go back to uh, Depew. Depew's the guy that started that. And uh, about 1895 or so, he developed uh, some splints. And Zimmer, I'm not really up on all this, but Zimmer, uh, Justin Zimmer, worked for Depew. And uh, uh, might be 1920s, 25, 27, went out on his own and started his own company. And then, uh, you know, as that took off, for a long time they did basically splints for people, you know, like you break your arm, you got a splint on it, and that kind of thing. One thing they, they don't say is that Depew also sold, sold smoking pipes. He, he imported wood from, I don't know, South America someplace and made smoking pipes out of it. So a long time, it was a real small, a small place. I know in World War I, they, they made a lot of splints for the soldiers. So eventually then it took off and kind of have, went the high tech that we have now. Um, let's see. Um, you know the Pennsylvania Railroad, the East-West Railroad used to be the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, back before airplanes, that was the main way. If you're going to the East Coast to, say, Chicago, you would take the train, which means that a lot of presidents came through here. One of them was Teddy Roosevelt. And I kind of like this story. It, this was actually after he was president. But the train he's on uh, stops at Warsaw to take water. He's not supposed to get off, not supposed to make any kind of a speech or anything. But people find out that he's on this train. And this is November, so it's getting dark. It's towards evening. But they all kind of run towards the train. I don't know if you can imagine this happening today. You know, a, a former president by himself on a train. But the, the people come up, and they start, you know, shouting at Teddy. So Teddy, being Teddy, you know, he comes out on the back, gives a little speech, and not only does that, but he goes down into the crowd and starts shaking hands. Can you imagine that happening today? And they said, Teddy Roosevelt, I'm sure you've seen pictures of him, you know, his big grin. They said, Teddy looked just like Teddy. And so pretty soon the train is starting to pull off. He jumps back on the train and runs off. Um, let's see. I, I'm trying to think of the name of the other guy. Uh, can you think? Of, he's from Ohio. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, when, when he died, Calvin Coolidge followed him. Anyway, I guess I'll go without it. He, died, he was here twice. Uh, once to give a speech at the courthouse. It was a big, a big occasion. And, and the second one, he, he came when he was dead. He had died out west, and his body was brought back. He went on the B&O Railroad, and it, it went through um, Syracuse and, and uh, Milford. And that turned out to be a big occasion because people, people in that era had never really seen a president. I mean, they went on TV or anything. So they, they all, around all the crossings in this county, and I think every place else, you know, people would go around there and take their hats off, and some people actually cried when he went by, and, and it was a big occasion to see a president. Now, here's my favorite story, though, of a president. This takes place in 1893. Grover Cleveland is president of the United States. There's a World's Fair in Chicago. So he's going to go from, as you'd expect, Washington to Chicago to kind of be some of the grand opening stuff. And when he gets to Warsaw, the train's going to go really slow. It's not going to stop, but he's going to get on this platform in the back, you know, and raise his hat and, I don't know, bow, and he's got a cane. And, you know, people are going to get to see the president. Now, it's 1893, so all they've seen is kind of a, a still picture of him. That's all, that's all they had. And he was... Let's say he was, he was uh, overweight a lot. I mean, he was, 
they said he was over 300 pounds, which back there, and being president, it might have been 400 or something. Now, there was one problem with that. He was a Democrat. And Warsaw was strongly Republican. And the people here did not want a Democrat being cheered in Warsaw. So, guess what they did? They found somebody that looked like Grover Cleveland. Now that took a trick because he's pretty big. And that's all people really knew that he was big. His, his name was Tom Hand. He was a, uh, well, a teamster, which means he drove wagons. Like maybe you were, uh, there was a lot of lumber uh, cut here, so you might have been lumber wagons and, uh, you know, I said, uh, said bad words to start. I mean, he probably knew every bad word there was and trying to guide horses and probably never had a haircut, never had a suit, all that stuff. But they, they got him a suit, they got him a haircut, they cleaned him up, uh, you know, a top hat, a cane, whatever, and they took him over to Columbia City and they put him on a train Then went through Warsaw about 20 minutes before the president's train. This was advertised as just the president coming here. So there was a pretty good crowd at the, at the depot and the train comes through carrying Tom Hand and he gets on the back you know, and he bows and he takes his hat off and, and according to the newspaper, he just put on a great show. So pretty soon, the train rolls away and the crowd kind of starts to leave. They, they think they've seen the president. Well, 10 or 15 minutes later, the, the train that really did have the, train, the president comes through. But by then, most of the crowd is cheered as left and he doesn't get many cheers. And that's how Warsaw has stolen cheers from the President of the United States. Imagine that happening today. I mean, that was all, all printed up in the newspaper. Uh, I, did, I did ask a guy, let's see, this is in the 40s, uh, maybe 1949 or so. And uh, he was working for the railroad and Harry Truman was coming through on the, on the railroad. And this is another thing you just can't imagine today. But they asked this guy, he was just out of high school, working for the uh, railroad in the summer. And uh, they wanted him to guard the railroad track. And he, he, he guarded the one on Bronson Street, which is the one that goes to the fairgrounds. And his job was to stand there, and if a car came up, make sure it stopped when the train was going through. They told him, you know, what time to be there. And he said, he was, he was thankful that no cars showed up. And, and when the, you know, he heard this whistle and figured that was it, because he, and the train roared through, he said he never could see Truman. There was just some lights on in there. And that was what he did. Imagine, imagine that being the security for the President of the United States now. It's just, it's just another time, another crazy thing. Um, any questions about any of this? No. No, I mean, he was going to, I don't know, Chicago or Kansas City or someplace. So, I mean, that's just, that's just how the security was. Um, do you know what parking is? Kids used to go parking. Yeah. yeah. You know, you'd, you'd, you and your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever go to some secluded spot and make out for a while. One of, the import, one of the places that used to be notorious for that was at Win uh, Winona Lake. Uh, south side, it's all built up with houses now. It was called Snake Island because there were snakes out there. Um, uh, it's still called Snake Island. I live right by there. Oh, you do? Good. Well, do you know about the parking that went on there? No, I don't. Oh, yeah. Kids used to park there all the time. <laughs> Winter, maybe not so much summer because it would have been... been you know, uh, what? I 
I'm sorry. It's just that I've never been outside the house, and I've never heard of any of these locations or places. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Winona Beach Road, this is south side. Where South Town neighborhood is now. Yeah, is. yeah. Um, let's see. The if you're our principal actually lives on Snake Island. Yeah. I don't know if he knows that. No, no, not in Winona Lake. It's South Side. Uh, you know where Winona Beach Road comes off of Country Club? Here. Okay. Well, there, there's just a little lot. It used to be not built up. It used to be just a little dirt turn around, and, and kids would build a fire on the, on the lake shore and, and kind of have parties and, you know, all kinds of stuff went on there. Um, that was a notorious spot. I was, I was asking a guy about this. This is a thing that you ask people stuff. And here, I might stop and say what you ought to do is ask, if you have grandparents, parents, ask them about stuff. You know, what was your first car? I know my dad's first car was a 1929 Pontiac. Imagine that. And he used to say it would take a, a trip to Fort Wayne. He was born in 1910. So, like when he was 10, it was 1920. But he would say a trip to Fort Wayne could take you, and back, would take you three hours. Because you might have a flat tire, you could get stuck someplace, you know. So ask your, ask your parents, grandparents about, you know, what they did, what it was like. Think of stuff to ask them. You might, might be kind of amazed the kind of stuff they did. Anyway, I was asking this guy about Park. And he said they used to go to Pike Lake. And the only way to Pike Lake at that time was to go through the cemetery. Um, if you know where the, sort of the uh, I don't know, headquarters buildings are, and if, and if you kind of go past that, there's sort of like a bandstand building. I think it's still there. And there's a road that went to the lake there. So he took his girlfriend down there uh, at you know, night, went through the cemetery, went down to the uh, lake shore. And so after a while, they're going to leave when well, the car is stuck. It had been raining, and it was slick, and the tires, I guess, would just spin. And so, so you know, they, they tried to get on, they couldn't. So they're stuck. So he's got to call somebody. They have no cell phone or anything like that. So he's got to walk. You know, this is midnight, 1 in the morning. He's got to walk someplace and find somebody with a phone. This is, I think, 1950, 4950. He's got a 48 Chevrolet. So he gets out, he walks, like I say, midnight uh, through the cemetery, you know, up to Sheridan Street, and he's looking for a house that got lights on. He gets clear up to Fort Wayne Street before he finds one, and, and he goes to the door, you know, knocks, kind of says what he is, and the, and the woman that answers the door kind of laughs at him and closes the door in his face. So he goes on to the next house and finds someone else there, and sort of the same thing happens. You know, the lady kind of laughs at him, but lets him use the phone. So he calls a friend of his. His friend comes and rescues him, takes him home. Uh, the car is still stuck there, but they get home. And, uh, you know, the next day they get the car out. So this sort of means, I mean, kids, oops, back then were still doing some some kind of crazy things, and probably no crazier than you guys do, or think about, or want to do. And uh, just a little bit about John Dillinger. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about old John Dillinger. You know, he was a bank robber back in the in the Depression of the 30s. And uh, I guess if your business, so to speak, is robbing banks, bulletproof vests might be kind of handy, don't you think? Well, uh, the Warsaw Police Department got some bulletproof vests to protect them just in case John Dillinger and, a, and his gang came to town. Well, I think this is kind of ironic, but those bulletproof vests is exactly what brought Dillinger to town. Because I'm not sure how they found out about that the Warsaw Police Department had it, but they came here to get them. So it was, uh, let's see, 1934, April, April of 1934, 
they come here in the middle of the morning, like, I don't know, one, two, three in the morning or something, it's all dark, and Warsaw had very few street lights then. There were a few over the intersections, and that's about it. So there's a policeman named Judd Pittenger, and he's kind of walking the beat downtown, checking doors are open, when John Dillinger and his gang come upon him. And they basically say, we know you got bulletproof vests, we want them, take them to them, we're taking them. Well, Judd wasn't maybe the smartest guy right then, but he grabbed for their gun. And the Dillinger gang pretty much hit him over the head with one of their revolvers and said, you know, you want to die or you want to take us to those vests. So he took them to the vest. He was at the corner of Buffalo. He was on Buffalo, maybe a little bit south of Center Street when this happened. The city de uh, police department was in a building straight across Center Street from the Lake City Bank downtown. So he kind of led them. Uh, I guess down an alley over to where the bank is in or across, and, it, and the uh, police station was on the upper level, so he went up, they, the gang went up there, got the bulletproof vest, they found some um, guns, they took a few guns, and went down, got in their cars and sped off, and the whole thing might have taken 15 minutes. Um, now, it uh, just happens this spring, the Historical Society and the museum, you know, the old Jane Museum, is going to have a display of Dillinger, because it would have been like 75 years ago or so when he was here. And, and we've got this, back then if you died, uh, important people died, they sort of made a, a plaster Paris thing of your face, it, they called a face mask, so it looks just like you do. Well, we have one of those. I think it's a copy of a copy of the original. And so, so we got this mannequin. You know, we, we put this death mask on this mannequin and cover it with a sheet. And when, when John Dillinger really was killed, he was killed two or three months after he was here, his body was on display just like that in Chicago where he was killed. You know, and people filed past. I'm not sure why you'd want to filed past a guy that was killed, but they did, a lot of people went past. So you can do that here, and it is kind of spooky. It looks just like John Dillinger, you know, because you can see his face and the, and the mask looks just like a guy, you know, and he's, and plus we have, let's see, we have at least one of the guns that were stolen from the police department. There's a bulletproof vest there. We think it's the original or one of them. I think he stole three of them. And some, some replica guns that, you know, Tommy gun that they used and, and all that stuff. So it'll be pretty interesting. I think you can go there and see it now, but there's going to be kind of a Dillinger display or festival in the middle of, of uh, April that you can go to, too. Uh, and there's all kinds of stories about John Dillinger here in the county. There are so many that I think if you add them all together, he could have lived here like five years or something because you just hear all kinds of things. Um, in the Depression, let's see, uh, Al Capone, we know, was here. Uh, a lot of these guys went to the uh, cottages around the lakes. And uh, they were kind of on vacation when they were here or laying low. So they, they didn't really, you know, try and make waves when they were here. And I'm not sure whether people really knew, you know, who was at these cottages. You know, if you saw a car roar up in the middle of the night and some guys getting out, it could have been some uh, people in the Prohibition that, that were just, you know, moving uh, whiskey or whatever. Bootlicking? Yeah. So we don't know, but we do know some of the, uh, the gangsters were here. You know, Chapman and the Barbies and, and up in there. Um, let's see. When you talk about prohibition and did one only, is it a part of that in terms of like pro and con with alcohol sales? Or uh, yeah, I don't know a whole lot about that. I know that I, I've read where um, illegal alcohol was made there, you know, moonshining was made at Winona. At the same time, they had meetings of prohibition party there. So you kind of have that 
Um, I know quite a bit of it was made here. Um, I guess I don't know a whole lot more than that. Um, you know, you see people being arrested for it from time to time and you know, all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was uh, kind of wild that way. Um, I might say go back to the trees. There used to be an oak tree that grew, let's see, it would be probably a little bit north west of where Madison School is. That was the biggest oak tree in, uh, I think, the state, maybe the U.S. It was a bur oak, which meant the, the, oak, the uh, acorns had these little spikes kind of on them, and that's how they called it a bur oak. But it was so tall that the top of it, I calculated once, would have been about as tall as the clock on the courthouse. So if you can imagine how tall that is. And the rest of the trees were maybe to the bottom of the roof. I mean, it had never been cut. And so it was just a giant tree. And the pioneers said there were a lot of trees like that in the old days, that tall. I mean, they're all cut down, if you can imagine that. And they, there used to be all kinds of walnut trees in this county. And you know, walnut, walnut wood is really valuable today. But they said there's so many of them that they, they just had to cut them down and burn them because they had, they had no market for them and they had to clear land for farming. But this oak tree, I know it was called the Berkey Oak because there was some people named Berkey uh, that lived there on that property. But it was sort of a tourist attraction. There'd be signs from Road 30 and Road 15 pointing out and, and you'd, you could go see this big tree. And it was, I mean, I don't know, it's something like 60 feet before the first branch. And I think it took three or four people to, to do, go around it. So, you know, if you can imagine what it was like back then, you know, when, when they uh, created this county, you know, they said it's, it's going to go into effect on uh, April 1st, I think, 1936. Maybe you've heard of the Sooners in Oklahoma where there was a day where you could go in and, and make your land claim. Well, that's sort of what happened here because uh, they knew that it was, there was going to be a county created here and actually a lot of the counties along here like uh, over at Columbia City, Plymouth, all these counties were created about the same time. So they, they, uh, some of them came in early, like the year before, kind of figured out where they wanted to, what would be a good site for a cabin or something and you'd have to cut down trees. Sometimes they had to cut a road through the trees to get to wherever they were going. Uh, there's even some, you know, signs that they built a little cabin and then they waited until the next year, the next spring to come in and, and claim it. And the reason it did that was, that was when you could register your land at some of the, the land offices, you know. So they, they'd come in and stake it out and they said when they did open it, it was almost a traffic jam getting into the county because there were that many people trying to move in and get new land, it was cheap. So, uh, you know, there was kind of a, a traffic jam of wagons backed up getting in. Now, there were only three or four roads in, so it didn't do too much. Um, let's see, how about, the, how about the, the Underground Railroad? Do you know what the Underground Railroad is? Well, we don't know too much about it because, you know, it was, it was really a quiet thing. You know, if, if uh, a slave escaped and someone caught him, they could be arrested and, and taken back down south. And, and a lot of times they were beaten before they were taken down south and the people that helped them could be put in jail. So it was a real quiet kind of thing. So we don't have a whole lot of information on it, but here's what we have. Um, Let's see, you know where the library is, in the library parking lot. And on the corner, let's see, diagonally across from uh, the Domino's Pizza, that corner of the parking lot, there used to be a building that was called the Shot Tower. It was called that because it was very narrow, very high, and I guess, you know, a shot glass is what people thought of it as. It was an inn. It started as an inn. 
and, and later, we know it existed before like 1850, so it would have been there when the Underground Railroad was in progress. And uh, later it became a uh, Christian scientist church. And I talked to several members of the church and they were always told that that was a, a station on the Underground Railroad. And there was a place in the basement, it was kind of a stone brick kind of thing, and there was a big opening that had been stoned over. And they said that was an opening to a tunnel, which kind of went uh, towards Center Street. And the slaves would get into the, the house, or the, the shot tower building, and get in the basement, and then when the time was right, they go through this tunnel and, and it came up near a livery stable where they could get in the wagon and go north. Um, there was a place, uh, White Pigeon, Michigan, and areas uh, just north of South Bend were considered uh, kind of safe havens for escaping slaves. So they wanted to go from here, maybe to Goshen, and then on up to Michigan. And from Michigan, they'd go into Canada if they could. So we have no idea how many slaves would have gone through there, but, but we believe some. There was also an early school uh, called the Cowan Academy. Now that was on Detroit Street between uh, the, Pennsylvania, the old Pennsylvania Railroad tracks and uh, Winona Avenue. There was a historical marker there. Um, it was started by, uh, let's see, some people named Cowan. And that was a station on the Underground Railroad. And the Cowan's granddaughters wrote a little bit, just, just a little bit about it, and said that, that the escaping slaves sometimes stayed there and waited until they could go, go north. And that's about all we have. So say if you ask your, your grandparents about something and you write it down, that might be preserved. Because if the grandparents of the Cowans had never written this down, we would have known nothing that happened there. There was also a guy named Reuben Williams who uh, started the, the paper that became the Warsaw newspaper. Um, he came to the county, his family, I don't know, 1840 or so. So he was here during the Underground Railroad. And he said one night, he was like 14, 15, this wagon pulls up to his father's house and there's seven or eight slaves in it, in the wagon. And uh, pretty soon this other guy comes up and gets in the wagon. One guy drove it, got off the, the driver. Another guy gets on, and they, then they go on north. And his father, you know, he's, he's not quite sure what this is. So his father kind of has to explain that these are escaping slaves, and they've come here, and they're heading north. And he said another time, uh, a wagon with, 14 escaping slaves came up and they were being held uh, here as a safe haven in a farm. Uh, we think it was around Packerton Road somewhere. We're not exactly sure. But a farm there and they, they'd stayed. The first seven arrived and were staying there. And another seven arrived. So there's 14 in this, in this barn. And they get word that, that the slave hunters are, have found out where they are and they're coming, so they got to get them out fast. So they, they take them north. They take them to, to Rube Williams' house. And then uh, this other guy comes up and they drive them on north. And they later learn that they do make it to Michigan and on to uh, Canada. So we know there was there's some activity here. And that's another kind of interesting you know, thing that we were part of freeing slaves. Any questions? Okay. Uh, what was it like during World War II? Uh, here? Well, uh, let me say, I'm not sure how many guys were killed. I think about 60 in the fighting. Um, but if you read the old newspapers, it just seems like every day there's somebody, you know, a pilot that shot down in a prison camp, you know, they're just, just everywhere. And I can't imagine what it was like kind of knowing that 
the guy next to you had been shot down or was missing or was killed. I mean, it would just be, you'd just be a, a horrible kind of thing. Um, let's see, who did, I, who did I talk to? I've talked to several people who were prisoners of war. One was shot down. Uh, he was a, a gunner on a, on a bomber that was shot down. And he was captured and, and spent time in a prison, prison of war camp. There were people here from every, every part of the war. In North Africa, several of them were captured in North Africa and spent most of the war in prison camps. Um, Italy, there were a lot of them in Italy. Of course, Germany, you know, France and Germany. Some of them went, uh, I know one guy that went into France on the afternoon of D-Day. Um, I know of a uh, guy that served in a tank. He was a tanker and was in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, here there was rationing. So, I mean, you couldn't get gasoline very much. You couldn't get uh, tires for your car. So, I mean, everybody would just been, you know, either you had someone in your family who was serving or you knew your neighbor did or so it, it just would have been been a horrible thing. And actually World War I might have been just as bad. Uh, you know, we had people all over the, in that and uh, the Civil War too, a lot of people here. One thing about the Civil War, see if you went into the army or, or military today, you'd probably be sent to a base and you might have other people there from, I don't know, California or, you know, Alabama or, you know, all over the country. But in the Civil War, you kind of made a company here. So you would have gone with people you grew up with, uh, you know, people went to school with, other, other schoolmates might have been in your same company. So, uh, you know, you would have known them and all the people here kind of would have known everybody that went down there. And it was, that was another just, you just can't imagine the stuff they would have seen. Uh, the soldiers in the Civil War here went mostly south, like Shiloh and, I don't know, around the... Uh, well, here's one thing I, I like to tell people. Uh, maybe you've heard of Vicksburg. That was on the Mississippi River and it was an important uh, kind of battle that the Union eventually got. There were people from here uh, at, at, the, at Vicksburg. And when that Union captured that, they were put on a... a steamboat and went up to Memphis, which is in Tennessee on the, on the Mississippi River. Now this is, this is kind of hard to imagine. Imagine you're doing this. So they got off there and they basically walked, marched. I mean, it took several days in all the camps. But they marched across Tennessee to Chattanooga, which is kind of near where the Smoky Mountains are. And then they, they started down south, and this is all the battles that led to uh, the capture of Atlanta. Uh, Gone with the Wind, think of Gone with the Wind. Uh, Chickamauga was a really bad battle for people here. I think something like nine or ten guys were killed, and I don't know how many were wounded. And sometimes you see pictures of, of men coming back with, you know, one leg. And I think it's sort of the same thing as um, World War II because some of the battles they were in, I don't know how you would ever forget it, the stuff you saw. But uh, from, from uh, like Chattanooga, then they fought all the way down to walking, you know, marching, all the way to Atlanta. And you probably heard of the uh, March to the Sea with General Sherman. You know, they went to Atlanta and they kind of burned everything. Well, a lot of guys from Warsaw were in that march. And that was near the end of the war, finally. And then they march up the Carolinas, you know, and they are in the, the, there was a grand parade at the end of the war, and they were in that grand parade at the end of the war. So a lot of men from Warsaw walked from Mississippi at Memphis, all the way across Tennessee, all the way down to Atlanta, all the way up to Washington, D.C. I mean, it took them two years to do that, but imagine walking that far today. Do you know, uh, I know Vietnam War put a lot of the country
Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. They were so mad about it. Do you right. know Warsaw's stance on that, considering, like, I figured it would be something that would have been in the newspapers? I don't think there was too much as far as, I was at IU then. We had, we had some great, I don't know, protests, you know. Actually, actually they had bands playing, so it was sort of a rock concert combined with an anti-war. You know, you'd jump, jump and say, you know, I don't know, what was it? No war, I forget what they say. Anyway, but here I don't think, I don't think, they, they just sort of covered the actual reports of what was happening in Vietnam. And again, there were, I know there were graduates of Warsaw High School that were killed in Vietnam. And again, it's just so sad to, you know, it, like your, some of your classmates, like two years from now, you might have found out that they had been killed in Vietnam. And I know several guys that came back uh, were just, you know, not the same when they come back. So that's, that's kind of bad. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the um, export of ice and also um, farming? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, there was a time, but before electricity, and you can make, you're talking about regular ice, um, when the only way to get stuff to cool your drinks was to take ice off the lakes. And basically every lake in the county had ice made on it. Um, at, at Center Lake, uh, at the bottom of Buffalo Street, you know, if you don't stop, you run right into the lake. As you're going to, just before you're going, like, off to the left, I think there's still a little park there. There were some really big ice houses there. And over, uh, let's see, what is it, on the east side of the lake was some more big ice houses. Winona Lake had some ice houses kind of where Argonne Road if you don't stop the Argonne Road and you're, you'd run into the lake, kind of in there. Also along the Country Club Drive part. Um, yeah, just every lake in the county had these, and they would put them in these big uh, ice houses at the side of the lake. They, they kind of had sawdust filling to keep them insulated. I talked to a couple guys that actually helped take the ice out. They, they'd have these saws connected to like a motor from Model T's and they'd, they'd cut these big chunks out of, out of the lake and they'd kind of have a, a canal cut and you'd sort of push the ice cubes through the little thing and then there'd be a little auger thing that goes up into the, and you'd store them in this ice house till summer and you'd you'd take them out and they'd have wagons that would go around to like the restaurants and the houses and my father-in-law actually delivered some of this. You'd have the big forks and you'd put them on your back and take them into, they'd have, uh, instead of refrigerators, they would have what they call ice boxes, which is like a glorified uh, cooler. You know, you'd put, the, you'd put the ice in there and you'd have the rest of the stuff in there and like every week, sort of like the milkman, you know, you'd get a new chunk of ice and that's all you had. And if it ran out or you had a, a year where there wasn't much ice on the lake, you just didn't have anything uh, to cool your drinks or, you know, you had no fans, no electricity. Um, as far as farming, I think that's one of the things that it made Kosciuszko kind of what it is, a, a fairly wealthy place. It was always a, a really big county and some pretty good farmland. I think it's always been kind of the corn and wheat and, you know, there was a time when every farm had, you know, a few horses, a few cattle, a few milk cows, just kind of little of everything. So, yeah, that, that's one of the things that, that's made the county what it is today. Uh, let's see, what can I, I let's see. Well, I can talk about Winona. I know you're from Winona. Er, uh, Winona, for a long time, was a uh, summer retreat. Think about, say you're not, it's 1910, and you are the richest person in the United States. 
you got you got millions. 1910, you know, like five. 10 million in 1910 might be, you know, 75 million or something. You know, you got so much money. Bread's bread's a, a penny or a nickel or something. A loaf of bread. So you're the richest person in the world. But in the summer. There's no air conditioning, so you are going to be as hot as you can possibly be. You know, doesn't matter how much money you are or what you do, but your only thing is to go to a lake. You know, where you can go swimming and you can get the breezes off the lake, and there, you know, there's a park. So that's kind of what made Winona start. And there were the guys named the Buyer Brothers. Maybe you know where the Buyer Home is there. They. Um, kind of were wholesalers of milk and, and butter and that kind of thing. And they'd go around the farms and collect it. And then they would ship it to the East Coast, like New York, Philadelphia, whatever. And there were some springs, you know, water springs along those hills in uh, Winona. And, and I think you're aware that water coming out of the ground is like 50, 55 degrees, something like that. So it was, it was cooling for the milk and they could store it a few days before shipping it out. And they were, uh, I think they were Presbyterians. But they started the hotel there, the Winona Hotel. And then it gradually started being home for, uh, oh, a lot of the churches would have their annual conferences there, you know, Methodists and Baptists. And so that was the big start of Winona. And then later they got uh, something called Chautauqua, which would be like summer, a series of summer programs. So like John Philip Sousa was there. You know, he's the big band leader. And, and I'm told that they would get off at the train station and they would kind of assemble. The train station was kind of above the uh, viaduct there. And they were all getting uniform and they would play bands and they had a big feathers on their hats and they would march down the street, you know, playing the band, and, and they would have big concerts. Um, there would be musicians from all over the world there. Uh, if you've heard of William Jennings Bryan, he ran for president several times. I think he was Secretary of State under Wilson. He was uh, in charge of the board of directors there. Uh, Studebaker, I think his first name is Henry, with the Studebaker Company. He was on the board there. Heinz, the ketchup guy, was there. So a lot of the, you know, important people were there sometime during the summer. Uh, Billy Sunday, he was an evangelist uh, who would draw just thousands of people there. He was a former baseball player, played for the, uh, he started out with a team that became the Cubs and then played for the Pittsburgh Pirates for a while and then, then became an evangelist. Um, and there were times, let's see, when Warsaw might have had four or 5,000 people, there'd be like 15,000 people in Winona Lake for some of these programs. Um, Glenn Curtis, have you ever heard of him? He was an early flyer, not long after the Wright brothers. Well, he flew a plane in there and landed on the, on the uh, lake and gave rides to people. Uh, Will Rogers, he was a comedian or, you know, gave these programs. He was there a lot. Uh, you know, you'd have violin players. You might have a senator, a U.S. senator, give a program on something. So that was, that was quite the place. Um, let's see. Argonne Road. On either side of Argonne Road, as you're going down to the, that used to be a golf course. And uh, winners of the U.S. Open Golf Tournament were there at least a couple times. Um, they had uh, croquet tournaments there. So, I mean, it was, it was quite the place. Uh, any questions about Winona? What's the, what is uh, Winona Lake, uh, his, like, biggest history? Well, I suppose the, uh, you know, how the Bayer brothers started it and, you know, and, and all the, uh, see Billy Graham was there. He, they sort of claimed he got his start at a meeting at Winona. Um, yeah, I guess just all the, uh, the celebrities were there and the crowds that were there. 
I know at some point, oh, say 1910 or so, people in Warsaw were amazed at the number of cars that were coming in. You know, 1910, there wouldn't have been too many cars. But they were just sort of one after another coming in. And a lot of these people had not seen a car. Uh, Winona was the site of a World War I training camp. And the uh, thing was, it, st it, it started just like a month or six weeks before the war ended. So, you know, not much actually happened there. But they got soldiers in there and they, they were training them to drive vehicles. I guess in 1910, a lot of people never had had a car. So they were kind of trying to teach them to, to drive. There was a wedding there. That was kind of interesting. Uh, uh, the guy was stationed there and his bride was, I think, so, uh, Southern Indiana or someplace. And she came up just a day or two before the wedding and kind of got the arrangements and, the, and they were married. And so at least he didn't have to go to the war, which would be good. Uh, Winona also had, let's see, have you ever heard of the inner urban? It was, it was an electric, it was started in 1901 on a lake because 1903, you know, there was no, ro no paved roads and if it got rainy and all that, it was hard to get on there. Um, and eventually they got tracks up to Milford and down to Peru on the south. And, and from those two cities, you could get on other inner urbans and uh, go all the place, southern Indiana, all over Michigan and Chicago. And so in 1903, that was really something, you know, because cars weren't very good. You could jump on this electrical powered thing and they had an electric generator. There's part of the building still standing. Uh, it was about where the Gatke, if you know where the Gatke building behind it, there's kind of a brick thing with sort of the start of a, a uh, smokestack. That's, that's where they generated it. And uh, I've talked to several people that rode that. There was, a, there was a loop around Warsaw. You could get off at different spots, and then it went on north. And she was from Milford. And uh, when I talked to her, this is like 10 or 15 years ago. She was like 95 then, so she remembered it. And she said she was playing outside once, and everyone said, you know, there's this wreck on the inner urban. And she said, she went right over there. She's like five or six, you know. And she said, they were taking this picture of it, and I got right in front of it, and my picture is on that thing. Now, the interesting thing is the Historical Society has that picture. And I never guessed that someone in that picture I, I could talk to. But there she is. And she's right in the middle of this. It's a neatest little thing. And this is, again, thing. Something maybe you could ask your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents about something. They might pull out something like that. She also said they, they had these passing zones. There was one track, you know. So, so you'd get one car would pull off to the siding, kind of, while the other one would come through, and then it would go. She said she was riding. This was summer. And she was riding with her mother on this thing. And she was nearing this passing zone, you know, and she, the train was going to go this way, and there's this other train coming this way. And, and she, you know, she's six or seven or something, and she said she got up and she jumped off the car because she figured it was going to wreck. She said her mother was so mad at her because about the time that she jumped off, the train she was on pulled right onto that siding, and the other, you know. So this is the kind of thing you can learn if you start asking people, and it's pretty interesting. And you know, trying to think of something to ask them and let them go on to something else. Um, I don't know. Here's a, here's another one. This is kind of a funny thing. Let's see. The ho there used to be a call uh, a, a, a hotel called the Hayes Hotel. It was where the downtown Lake City Bank is now. It was torn down, I think, about 1960 or something, but started in the 1880s. So this was told in the newspaper. I think you, I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, a family is moving to Warsaw. It's like 1890 or something. And, and uh, they have to stay for a few days. I don't know if their house is not ready or their furniture hasn't gotten here or whatever. They come in on the train and they stay at the Hotel Hayes. 
but it's January. So one of these, well, they come vortexes, Arctic vortex or something comes through. So it is really, really cold in this place. You know, the heating's not too good. And they're, they're on some upper floor. And they're just freezing. The whole family's freezing to death. And so they decide to go down and ask for a room inside because they're right on the outside and the wind's blowing them and they're really cold. So they, get, they go downstairs and go up to the front lobby and they're talking about whether you can get, you know, the father brings this one kid. I think he's like third grader or so. You know, up, up to ask if you can move. Okay, you got that in your head. Kid and his father asking for a new room. They're at the front desk. Okay, hold that for a little bit. Back in those days, a lot of people lived in the hotel, especially if they were not married, you know, because you, you could get your room, a place to sleep, you know. And there was a doctor that lived there. And that same night, there is a lady who's given birth to a baby. Uh, best we know, it just says south of Winona Lake. <clears throat> so he's had to, had to hook up his wagon, you know, and all that stuff and go out in this freezing cold and, you know, wind and he's freezing to death and, you know, he's covered with ice and... So eventually the baby arrives and everything's fine and he, he's uh, finished with all that and he, and he drives his wagon back and he's just covered, you know, covered with frost and cold and so he comes in to the motel or the hotel, his hotel where he lives and he comes up to the front desk right when this guy and his kids, so remember the, the guy and his kid are standing there, the kid's like third grade. And the kid takes one look at the doctor and sees he's covered with frost and says, good Lord, man, what room up there did you have? <laughs> you know, it's cold in the place. You guys have like, we only have like four minutes, so if you have a quick Okay, any questions, quick. How about this, okay. Do what? When Warsaw started to show more diversity. That's a good question. Um, actually, <clears throat> this w seems to be uh, rather, let's say, somewhat favorable to black people at least. Um, early on, I think it's part of it because the, the Underground Railroad came here. And for a long time, um, there was a pretty good black community. Now, I don't know about, you know, people from uh, Hispanics. I'm not sure about that. Uh, that would have been a little bit later. But I know we were fairly uh, welcoming the black people even back then. There was a black uh, church called the Methodist Episcopal, or African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME. Um, I think the building still stands. It's on Winona Avenue between uh, Lake and Washington on the north side there. And they would have you know, like fundraisers and a lot of stuff about the fundraisers uh, appeared in the newspaper and said, you know, support these people. You know, they're building their church or I know they had a, a quartet that would go around and sing to people, and, and you might say, you know, I know they sang to the uh, editor of the newspaper once, and he, he would talk about how they were, the voices were just great, and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. And they would have revivals, invite everybody to the rivals. I know there's some record of, you know, they would have uh, fiddles and, and a lot of music, and, and they would say you could hear it go across the lake. Um, so to that extent, I'm sure it wasn't perfect. Well, in fact, I guess I should go on to this too. Uh, during the 30s, the, there were a lot of people here in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, you know, you can't hardly imagine that now. And I know there was this big parade. I forget about what it was. Uh, all these people 
dressed in the in the clan you know uniform and even the horses had the uniform and so the the clan was a big thing and it, this was in the 20s when when the clan was big in indiana and a lot of the midwest and i know they'd have these inter, uh, initiation rites where they go to a, maybe a farm and they'd, they'd bring new people in and they'd be surrounded by cars with their lights on and they burned several crosses here in warsaw and silver lake and so, I mean, there's that side of it, too, so it's kind of mixed. But uh, I think that's about all I can ask or say about that. But uh, I know it wasn't perfect, but there was some, you know, some good things about it, too. So it's kind of a mixed on that. Anything else? I'll just close by saying you probably don't realize, uh, you've heard of the gold rush, you know, in California. And there were actually a lot of people in this county that got gold fever. You know, you couldn't sleep yet. You just thought you'd go out there and find a lot of money. And so they, they left. They got in wagons, and I can't imagine going in a wagon across the country. But they did. And some of them actually found enough gold that they could take a boat home, you know, clear around to New York and a, and a railroad train across and buy, buy land for farming. And they did pretty well. So, you're welcome.